With all false theories set aside, it is now clear as is the summer's sun that Reginald Jeeves, from now on to be known simply as Jeeves, was the only male offspring of Basil Jeeves and was therefore the grandson of the Reverend Theophilus Jeeves, the perpetually penniless curate of pottering up Piddlecombe near Poole. Theophilus, being supposedly married, though we know not to whom, had numerous children, and of these at least five survived their ill-nourished childhood. These were respectively named Mabel, Annie, Basil, Emily and Edith. Of the four daughters, Edith married Charles Silversmith, a brother of Tobias Silversmith, the jeweller of Hackney Wick. The other daughters, plain beyond example, lived to become three unmarried aunts. Their brother Basil seemed at first to be made of sterner stuff, for after obtaining a scholarship at Oriel College, Oxford, he remained at the university as a lecturer in philology, the study of language. But regrettably, he married beneath him, to Daisy Wiggins, the popular barmaid of the Cow and Crescent, thus putting an end to what might have been a distinguished academic career. Soon after the nuptials, Basil and Daisy moved to London, where their only child, Jeeves, was born. For the rest of his life, Jeeves' father was to make a scanty living as a proofreader and index compiler. We may picture him as eccentric, shabby, learned and normally drunk. But one thing he always retained was a magnificent, if pedantic, command of the English language. Daisy, who came from rural Oxfordshire and who had no education at all, possessed, nevertheless, the common sense which Basil so conspicuously lacked. She earned her living as a cleaner of the auditorium at Sadler's Wells, but found time to cook occasional meals for her husband and child. Jeeves in those days had some contact with aunts Mabel, Annie and Emily, and had at least heard of his uncle Charles then a footman in Wimpole Street. But he owed his upbringing to his father. If he went to school, there is no record of it. We must rather suppose that life, with his father swaying over his proof sheets, was an education in itself. Jeeves was left an orphan by the age of 14, but had gained by then a surprising gift for grammatical self-expression. His relatives sought to provide for his future by apprenticing him to Tobias Silversmith. But after six months, it was clear that the boy had no aptitude for the jeweller's craft. So he was attached, as hall boy, to the household of Mr Esmond Haddock, of Deverill Hall, King's Deverill, in Hampshire, a household to which Charles Silversmith, Jeeves' uncle by marriage, had recently been appointed as butler. Jeeves soon came to realise that his duties were far from onerous, his first task being to keep his uniform spotless, his second to carry logs for the fire, his third to pass a hot iron over each day's times and morning post. While not running errands, he could watch the butler and note the dignified way in which he would announce a visitor or reveal that dinner was served. No longer the slim footman of Wimpole Street, Charles Silversmith had become in middle age a figure to inspire both awe and dread. In his presence, even the older house guests were somewhat subdued and the younger guests were frankly petrified. But the young Jeeves was an observant lad and he quickly learned to say nothing but to listen well. He thus found out that Esmond Haddock, J.P., his bachelor employer, heir to a fortune made from Haddock's headache hokies, was much under the influence of his resident aunts Daphne, Emmeline, Harriet and Myrtle. Of these, the most obvious menace was Aunt Harriet, who continually urged her nephew to economise. If young Jeeves had not already learned in his childhood to be wary of aunts, he would surely have discovered this most important fact at Deverell Hall. During his years as hall boy, Jeeves had every reason to regard Mr. Silversmith with veneration, but he was more influenced, in fact, by Mr. Haddock's valet, Stephen Upner. 
In my opinion, you should aim at becoming a gentleman's personal gentleman. Why, you may ask? Because, I reply, you go where the master goes. To see the world, you must first learn how to press a suit, how to pack a portmanteau, how to hint gently that a collar is frayed. To be a valet, you need a fund of knowledge, an observant eye, a talent for looking the other way, and a gift, above all, of tact. You, Jeeves, could learn this art, and who, with this prospect before him, would be content to do nothing but lay the table and uncork the wine? Greatly impressed, Jeeves thanked Mr. Upner for his good advice. One day, he resolved he would follow it. While the young Jeeves was laying the foundations of his career at Deverill Hall, the home of Mr. Haddock, under the tutelage of the formidable butler, Mr. Silversmith, there were occasions when the lessons he learned were acquired the hard rather than the easy way. One such occasion that was to remain as a searing of the soul to Jeeves for many years to come concerned his employer's Aunt Harriet, a tall, angular woman with grey hair and a grating voice, the victim of many mysterious complaints which she readily described in detail to anyone foolish enough to ask her how she was. She specialised in headaches and shared them generously with her relatives. One day in late summer, when the family and guests were having tea on the lawn, she complained at length about a sleepless night. Two lady guests expressed their sympathy, but with that distant expression which was the prelude to moving away from her. Jeeves, told to make himself generally useful on these occasions, was within earshot, fetching rugs and moving deck chairs into or out of the shade. Having made a mental note of her complaint, he later came up to her, and with all due apologies for his temerity, offered her a packet of Haddock's Headache Hokies. When I want your advice, Jeeves, I shall ask for it. Until then, you will kindly hold your tongue. She retired to her room with a renewed headache. And Jeeves, panic-stricken, hid in the potting shed until the family had gone indoors. Later in the day, he was summoned to appear before Mr. Silversmith. It has been brought to my notice, Jeeves, that you have been guilty of a serious breach of conduct. A young man in your position should never be heard saying anything other than yes, sir, or very good, madam, as the case may be. Your function, Jeeves, is to appear immaculate, to do as you're told, and to avoid notice at any time. Is that understood? Yes, Mr. Silversmith. You will now practice the art of silent movement. And I shall expect you so to behave that we none of us know that you're in the house. Yes, Mr. Silversmith. You may go, Jeeves. That concluded the first significant event in Jeeves' period of service at Deverill Hall. The second and last took place some two months later. He heard at that time a rumour that Mr. Haddock had invested in a company called Baron Bogland Land Development, of which Sir Jasper Todd was chairman. When the company went into voluntary liquidation, Mr. Haddock was thought to have lost some thousands of pounds, not enough to ruin him, but enough to make him aggrieved and irritable. At Aunt Harriet's suggestion, he now sent for Jeeves, she being present at the interview which ensued. Mr. Haddock explained that unforeseen circumstances had made it imperative to curtail his household expenses, with Jeeves' wages costing him two shillings a week, he was forced to dispense with his services. But, he added, as Aunt Harriet glowered in the background, he could give him more than just a good reference. His aunt, Dame Daphne Winkworth, was principal of the Pickle Rod Academy for Young Ladies. She required a new page boy and was willing to take Jeeves on. And count yourself lucky to be employed at all. With this parting shot, Aunt Harriet left the room with a flourish and allowed her nephew to complete the transaction without further interruption, 
It was clear to her that his proposed economy would recover his loss in about a century and a half. As for Jeeves, he accepted his new appointment with some misgiving, aware as he was that experience at a girls' school would do little to prepare him for a career as a gentleman's personal gentleman. He realised, however, that there was no future for him at Deverill Hall while Aunt Harriet retained her influence there. He asked the advice of Mr. Upner, who shuddered for a moment before explaining that although coming from the best families, all the pupils at Dame Winkworth's schools were problem children. Whatever else Steve's did, he must not lend them money, place their bets for them, buy them cigarettes, or help them run away. He must also not offend them, lest they tell Dame Winkworth he had tried to kiss them in the shrubbery. Looking at Jeeves' situation from every angle, Mr. Upnor concluded, it was clear he would need all his wits about him. That this was a ludicrous understatement may not have been apparent at the time. It became obvious enough from the moment that Jeeves entered the great gates of Pickle Rod Academy, Starvely Chillingworth near Droitwich, and heard them close behind him with a resounding clang. Picklerod Hall was built in 1887 for the late Mr. Elisha Clutterbuck, who made his fortune from non-sulphurous iron ore. Alfred Waterhouse was the architect, and some there are who maintain that he was losing his grip at this later period in his career. Be that as it may, Picklerod remains an impressive example of Victorian Gothic, and it certainly has all the essential requirements for a boarding school, an assembly hall, a chapel, a library, level ground on which to play hockey, and, most important of all, a park from which escape is all but impossible. Once a surly lodgekeeper had been installed, Dame Daphne felt confident of keeping the girls in and keeping undesirable visitors out. Her own apartments overlooked the main entrance. No man slept on the premises and the porter, Hard Rock, arrived each morning on his bicycle in time to ring the bell at seven o'clock. When the outer gates shut behind Jeeves, he was shown to his upstairs room in the lodge, furnished with iron bedstead, flock mattress, washstand and basin. When he reported for duty at the back entrance of the main building, Mr Hardrock told him what his duties would be. After taking the morning's newspapers to the principal's apartment and the common room, he might breakfast with the other servants and tidy up the top floor. At nine, he would collect the letters for post and take them to the pillar box outside the main gate. At 9.30, he would report to the principal. And so his day was organised from hour to hour until the last bell sounded for lights out at ten. All that, explained the elderly and bespectacled Mr Hardrock, was simple enough. But Jeeves had also to learn to deal with the girls. The ones to be wary of are those that try to make friends with you. Then there are the girls with the red hair. Don't trust them for an instant, and don't let them catch you alone. What happened to the last page boy? He had to leave rather suddenly and without a character. The girls complained to the principal that he tried to kiss them. In the shrubbery? No, that was another page boy. The last but two. We seldom seem to keep him for long. Although it seemed to Jeeves that it would have been a great deal easier if he'd been employed in a boys' school, he was determined not to allow any red-haired young ladies to play their tricks on him. The daily timetable allowed about 15 minutes between morning assembly and the first period of work, time available for fetching books and washing hands. It was during this pause for thought that Jeeves was accosted one day by a young, fair-haired girl called Brenda Bunting, she was breathless from having pelted down the upper stairs, but her message was clear enough. A bird had flown into her attic room and was unable to find its way out. It, it was dashing itself against the window panes, and the room was being covered with feathers and dirt. Would Jeeves come to the rescue? After three weeks at Picklerod, Jeeves regarded all the girls with dark suspicion. But Brenda was small, innocent and tearful, and had no background of crime. 
The two of them reached the top floor in record time. Brenda gazed at Jeeves admiringly as he threw the door open and entered. A second later, the door slammed behind him and he heard the key turn in the lock. There was no bird in the room and no sign that any bird had ever been there. He had been fooled. And what would Dame Daphne say if it transpired that he had been found in Brenda's bedroom? At this point, Jeeves remembered that the dormer windows of these attic rooms opened on a parapet which offered a means of escape. He strode to the window, which opened helpfully at that moment, to reveal the kind face of the school's only American pupil, daughter of Syracuse W. Semper, the glamorous, red-headed Jill Semper from New York City. You poor dear. What a rotten trick to play on you. Never mind. You can escape this way. Come to Mother. I am most grateful to you, Miss. But I want a tiny reward for letting you out. Just one little kiss. Agreed? Very well, Miss. Oh, you beast! What, what, what the devil's going on? All right. Hold it, everybody. We've got the pictures. Breaking free, Jeeves saw that three other girls were gathered round, the one with the camera being the red-haired Sally Phipps Gunning. The other two, on the other side of him, were holding wine glasses which were being filled from a bottle. The snap just taken would record something more than a casual kiss. It would be a memento of a rooftop orgy, a night on the tiles. How on earth could he have been so easily trapped? A week later, he was intercepted in the entrance hall by Sally Phipps Gunning. Hello, Jeeves. That photograph turned out rather well. I thought you'd like to see the print. A good likeness of you, we thought. The other prints and the negatives are hidden, but not in my room. Susan and Kate and I and one or two of my friends are a bit tired of them um, cleaning our shoes. We thought you'd like to do them after supper. We'll put them outside our doors and, um, yes, we'll provide the boot polish. Very good, miss. What else could he say? He was to clean and polish their shoes for many weeks to come. But this was only the beginning. For Sally and her friends had other tasks for him, some menial and others increasingly dangerous. The crisis came towards the end of that first term. Sally Phipps Gunning waylaid Jeeves in the passage behind the scullery. Producing a ten-shilling note, she told Jeeves that she required him to purchase some cigarettes and a bottle of port so that she and her friends could have an end-of-term party. You will do this for me, Jeeves, won't you? Yes, miss. What other reply was possible? A few minutes later, Jeeves was sitting on the back stairs in deepest dejection. And that is where Miss Harbottle found him. Miss Eunice Harbottle taught English literature up to sixth form level. She was middle-aged and spectacled with a pink nose and a permanent sniff as a result of sinus trouble. By the rivers of Babylon I sat down and wept. Tell me, Jeeves, what your trouble is. After Jeeves had told the doughty Miss Harbottle every detail of the plot to blackmail him, Miss Harbottle pondered for only a short minute. Leave this to me, Jeeves. I know one or two things about Miss Phipps Gunning that I am quite sure she would not wish to reach the ears of Dame Daphne. Jeeves followed this advice and was accosted again two days later by Sally, whose looks, as Miss Harbottle would have remarked, now bore a terrible aspect. I have some photographs for you, and the negative. We decided not to hold that party after all. We think, by the way, that you're a, a nasty, sneaky, squeaking, pink-eyed rat. Yes, miss. So ended what might have been a beautiful friendship, and so began Jeeves' new life under the tutelage of Miss Harbottle. She had decided to give him the education he lacked, 
and he could easily have had a far worse teacher. She had a genuine love of literature and found in Jeeves a more responsive pupil than most of the girls she was paid to instruct. Whenever the girls were on holiday over the next three years, Jeeves was left with Miss Harbottle and a free run of the library. Each day he began with Shakespeare or Milton, while each afternoon he relaxed with Kipling or Keats. Browsing on his own, he came across Spinoza and Nietzsche and dabbled in philosophy. He owed to his father a gift for spoken English, and to this he now added a wide and widening knowledge of literature, with a few Latin tags for decoration. When the girls returned at the beginning of each term, Jeeves was once more the witness of their revolting behaviour. When Helena Nutshell wrote naughty words on the bathroom ceiling, Dame Daphne was heard to declaim, What else can we expect? An ancestor of hers was a fully paid-up life member of the Hellfire Club. Other events which Jeeves was to remember included the fire alarm, which was started by the planting of a smoke grenade, stolen from someone's elder brother in the brigade, the laying of the false scent, which led the local hunt to race at full cry through the central corridor and out through the staff common room, the unexpected visitor, a countess, seemingly, with a granddaughter to educate, who turned out to be one of the girls in disguise, the boys, seen in the dormitory, whose presence there led to a full-scale inquiry, but whose shorts and blazers were afterwards found in a cupboard, the gaming salon established in what had been the wine cellars, and Miss Pearson's discovery of the roulette board, the beer-brewing plant set up in the disused harness room, and the protection racket which deprived the new girls of their pocket money. Thinking about all the escapades which had come to his knowledge, Jeeves shuddered to think that these revolting specimens of girlhood would someday marry and produce yet others of their like. It was at this stage in his life that young Jeeves decided against marriage altogether. It was a bachelor he would remain, a gentleman's personal gentleman he ought to be. Jeeves was not wholly averse to flirtation, and he was later to be seen, though rarely, on the dance floor. But wild horses could not have dragged him to the altar, and there is no record, indeed, of these animals having even made the attempt. So for three long years, Jeeves remained at Picklerod Hall. But the end had to come, and he finally owed his downfall to the Honourable Sylvia Soulful, a new girl in what was to prove his last term. She was no hell-raiser, but merely a girl who yearned for male affection, something which had no place in the Academy's prospectus. Aroused, and she was all too easily aroused, by her reading of Romeo and Juliet, she cast poor Jeeves in a role for which he was singularly under-rehearsed. He was not particularly flattered by her expressed preference, there was, after all, no other male under sixty within her orbit, and he certainly did nothing to encourage her. Who was Sylvia, he asked himself, and what was she that all of the swains should adore her? In truth, she was nothing out of the ordinary, and could have leaned on a balcony for a long time before anyone responded to the challenge. When Jeeves failed to respond in any way, Sylvia revealed all in letters addressed to her elder sister, letters which were promptly shown to her mother. That it was a one-sided friendship was sufficiently apparent, but Dame Daphne, when informed, thought proper to end it. She sent for Jeeves and told him that his successor had been appointed. He himself had not been at fault, but Lord Warpleston, chairman of the school's board of governors, had a vacancy for a second footman. Jeeves was to leave in the morning and report to Lord Warpleston at once. In later years, Jeeves was to look back on his curious stay at Dame Daphne's school for young ladies with much greater affection than he did at the time he left to enter the employ of the Earl of Warpleston. For it was at Picklerod Hall that he was able to develop his lifelong love of literature. But now he was to acquire a new and perhaps equally important body of knowledge, a knowledge of the British turf. 
Lord Warpleston's country house was at Warpley Maltravers, his townhouse in Curzon Street, his office in Southampton, but his heart was in Newmarket. In the world of commerce, he was known as the chairman and principal owner of the Pink Funnel Line, trading to Argentina and Brazil. But when he inherited his title following the unfortunate death of his brother, it was not in shipping that he showed his interest lay. He closed his country house, moved to Curzon Street, and began what some would describe as a life of dissipation. For a number of years, he was much in evidence in the West End, no big social event being complete without him. He presently announced his engagement to Agatha Wooster, who had been the most formidable debutant of a vintage year. The match was approved by the two families concerned, and photographs appeared in all the society periodicals. Understandably apprehensive about the marriage to which he was now committed, Percival made vigorous use of the period of freedom which remained to him, going so far as to take Totty Lushington to a ball at Covent Garden. What actually happened there has passed into legend and is the subject of many a whispered reminiscence, but the upshot was that he and Totty were thrown out and taken to Vine Street Police Station. This event, and their subsequent appearance in court, had ample press coverage, and the clippings were enough to end the Third Earl's engagement. He was rarely seen in the nightclubs, as from this time, and he took up what was to be his normal residence at Warpley Maltravers. He had a place, Saddlescope Lodge, near Newmarket, and owned at one time a half-share in a filly called Dainty Lass, winner of the Oaks. But his enthusiasm for the sport was not enough in itself to ensure his success. The horses he owned were apt to go down with glanders, the horses he backed were rarely even placed. He was chairman, as we have seen, of the governors of Picklerod Hall, and it is the sad fact that at least a dozen of the girls incarcerated there could have placed his bets for him with a far greater measure of success. That he never asked their advice is understandable, for no sporting news was supposed ever to pass its castellated gate. But even his own domestic staff did better on the turf than he did. Bugsley the butler lost money, admittedly, but this was through following his master's lead through a mistaken notion of loyalty. Formwright, the first footman, did well. Gunn, the gamekeeper, did better still. And Vasey, the valet, did best of all. That Vasey should often spot the winner is understandable, because he, unlike the others, went with the Earl to Newmarket, and so had ready access to the racing stables, or at least to the public houses where the odds were banded about. Vasey made it a rule in betting to do the converse of what his employer had decided to do, a practice which saved him from many a costly blunder. But he never gave tips to his fellow servants, saying that careless talk might shorten the odds. Coming into this household, Jeeves began what was to be the work of a lifetime, the study of form. His knowledge was encyclopedic, before he so much as placed a bet of his own. That Jeeves knew his subject backwards was generally recognised, and the day came when he was actually called in to settle a dispute between Lord Warpleston and his horsey friend, the Honourable Mark Cannonbone Fetlock. Look, Jeeves, we've been talking about Hyperion and of why so little was expected of him at first. The general here thinks that he stood only fifteen hands. I can't believe that. I stand to lose my bet if he's right. Your money is safe, sir. Although, to be sure, I have heard that said about Hyperion before. He stood fifteen hands and one and a half inches on the day he won the derby, though he was indeed a horse with fine confirmation. As Shakespeare says... Was he a betting man? I fancy so, sir. As witness his words... Round-hoofed, short-jointed, fetlock, shag and long, broad breast, full eye, small head and nostril wide, high crest, short ears, straight legs and passing strong, thin mane, thick tail, broad buttocks, tender hide. Good grief! I'd always thought of Shakespeare as a hurdle in the school certificate, a sort of Beecher's Brook. He had an eye for a horse, sir. 
You may recall his contrasting description of a probable loser. Possessed with the glanders, and like two more in the chine, troubled with the lampus, infected with the fashions, full of wind galls, sped with spavins, rayed with the yellows, past cure of the fives, stark spoiled with the staggers, benorned with the bots, swayed in the back, and shoulder shotten. You will find the passage in The Taming of the Shrew, Act 3, Scene 2. In his former description of a likely winner, he should perhaps have specified that the animal should be able to convert lactic acid into muscle sugar while at the gallop, but he might have found that difficult to rhyme or scan. Will that be all, sir? <laughs>